Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to tonight's program with acclaimed chef, Bryant Terry. He is in conversation with Anjali Menon, member of the Inforum Advisory Board. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club is going full speed ahead with the full slate of live and online programming this fall. We ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work this year and beyond. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org online to learn more, and you can also click the blue donate button you see to the right side of your screen live during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Bryant Terry and Anjali Menon to Inforum. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anjali Menon, a current board member here at Inforum. Welcome to tonight's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. This evening, I'm so excited to be in conversation with Bryant Terry. Bryant is a vegan chef, food justice activist, and the author of several books. And today we'll be talking about his sixth book, Black Food, Stories, Art and Recipes from Across the African Diaspora. And it's a compilation of illustrations, recipes, playlists. In many ways, it's, it's more than a, than a cookbook. In Black Food, Bryant creates a feast for the senses aimed at celebrating the African diaspora's influence on food and culture. But before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that again, if you would like to ask questions, please ask it in the chat or the comment section. We'll try to get through as many as we possibly can. <clears throat> so with that, Chef, shall we get started? Let's do this. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. So the first question I have for you is, in the very beginning of the book, you talk about Black food as a communal shrine to these shared histories of the diaspora. And you draw on history and memory, as you say, but you also look forward in this book. And so it's a sort of like medley of past and present and future. How did you think about putting together that sort of narrative and why was that important to you? Sure. Well, I'll say um, this concept that you're describing of looking backwards as we move forward is a, a concept called Sankofa in um, the, the Akan culture of West Africa. And it's, you know, widely used um, in terms of you know, African-Americans and other people in the African diaspora kind of embracing, um, you know, many of the concepts, these ancient concepts that we've seen in, in different African cultures. And so Sankofa is this idea of bringing best practices, ideas, teachable moments, things that have worked um, along with us as we're moving forward. And it's really about standing on the shoulders of ancestors, recognizing uh, them for um, just simply existing, but all the, the lessons that they've uh, taught us and, 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 you know, just thinking about how we can continue to bring that knowledge and wisdom um, as we navigate moving forward. And, you know, this has been central, dare I say, a cornerstone of my body of work. I've always been very in touch with, um, the need for us to recognize the elders and ancestors who've come before us. And in terms of my efforts to create a more just and healthy and sustainable food system or getting people eating more dark leafy greens or encouraging people to grow their own food, whether it's, you know, community gardens or urban farms or um, at home, if one has available space, um, you know, these are lessons that I learned growing up with grandparents parents and family who came from the rural South and um, understood the importance of self-determination and feeding oneself. In fact, my, my paternal grandfather would often say to me, you know, if you rely on others to feed you, then um, if they decide to stop feeding you, you'll starve. <laughs> and so, you know, I always- Very wise, very wise person. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I just, it, it's important for me to always recognize that my work is about, you um, helping us remember, piecing back these histories, um, maybe presenting them in a, in a way that is 
palatable or, or a little more graspable for the uh, modern audience. But th this is ancient wisdom, ancient knowledge that um, I feel like it's my responsibility to um, share because this is uh, my life's calling, the work that I was put here to do. That's incredible. And in fact, on that point, um, in the book as well, there's a passage that sort of says to be a Black food creative means to be one part artist, one part steward of the craft, as you were sort of alluding to, um, one part storyteller. And I actually find it fascinating that the book, while it's called Black Food, you start with stories first, art second, and then recipes. Um, <laughs> even though, of course, this is this is a, a cookbook, but, it, but it's not quite. And so I, I'm actually curious as to, you know, again, how you think about, as you were just talking about storytelling mm -hmm. as part of food and culture and telling the story. Well, I, my work has been pushing back against a lot of things. And one is what I see as this chasm that our industrialized food system has created, where we have, you know, placed food as this commodity on one side and many other things that have been traditionally, you know, inseparable um, with the way that we cook, the way that we grow food, the way that we eat, things like art and culture and music and community. You know, our industrialized food system, it, it those don't have a lot of value <laughs> in that equation. And so I, I see much of my work helping to bridge that gap. And, and a lot of it is experiential. It comes from lived experience. You know, I come from a musical family. My grandfather, Edward Bryant, um, he had a traveling gospel quartet in the South in the 1940s and 50s. Eddie Bryant and the all and the uh, Eddie Bryant and the Four Stars of Harmony was the name of his group. And they were wow. one of the first, I think they were the first black um group to perform on radio um in Memphis. And because of my um, grandfather's uh, love of and, and connection to music. All of his children were um, musicians in some way, from my mom who sings in the choir at her church to my uncle Don, who at 79 uh, last year was nominated for his first Grammy. For, oh my um, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, a, it was a big moment for his career and for our, our whole family because, you know, he started off as a uh, a solo. Well, he started off in music groups with my uncles and then a solo artist. And then he became the, the house songwriter for High Records, which is um, a storied soul music label in Memphis that had, um, you know, Al Green and Willie Mitchell and um, Ann Peebles, who um, is my aunt, because um, my uncle married her. And um, wow, you know, whenever we had family gather gatherings, it would be Uncle Don on the piano playing, his um, brothers and my mom and her sisters harmonizing. You know, um, there would be food on the table, there'd be laughter, there would be um, other people from the community coming by, there would be bags of produce because, you know, the the food that my family was producing in their urban farm, you know, home garden and um you know, urban farm, because every bit of available space was being used to grow food. They would give, you know, bags of produce away to, to friends and family and neighbors. And so all these were early lessons. Once again, going back to just this, um, you know, much of my work being driven by um, both history and memory. And, you know, when I think about the way in which we talk about the kind of ethos of the Northern California Berry um, ethos or the, the ethos that was largely popularized um, in this area of eating locally, seasonally and sustainably, I mean, you know, the food that we were eating at home was as local as our backyard garden. We always ate was in what was in season and we would harvest, literally harvest food right before our meals. And so um, it's really important to me to connect with people uh, and, and help, you know, if I were to kind of frame what my larger mission in, in life has been, it's been, you know, helping to move people um, and, and, and really, Encouraging them to, you know, think about ways that they could shift their habits, their attitudes, and their politics regarding food. And when I first started doing this work, I would go to these national conferences geared towards, you know, fixing our broken food system or helping to reel in our runaway food system or whatever ways in which um, people were talking about framing uh, or um, 
addressing the problems in our food system that's largely controlled by a handful of multinational corporations. Um, I noticed that oftentimes the people who were most impacted by the issues that we were discussing, whether it's migrant farm laborers or people living in urban centers that are often described as food deserts or um, small to mid-sized farmers who are, who are struggling just to keep food on their tables. Um, I noticed that those people weren't in the rooms. And when I would look at the, um, you know, the people in leadership in many of these national gatherings, um, oftentimes there are policymakers or academics, um, you know, sometimes farmers. But uh, what I notice is that the the conversations often start with it with the heady and intellectual ideas or the public policy, and those things are important. You know, they're vital to having conversations about transforming our food system. But it, it seemed like there are a lot of class and educational bias that were baked into these spaces, and I felt like it was my mission or or, or one of my main goals was widening the net. You know, creating more space at the table and bringing more people into the conversation, um, especially those who've been most impacted by um, food insecurity or, you know, whatever issues we're talking about. And, and, you know, for me, one of the most powerful ways of doing that is food itself, you know, actually helping people engage with the, the sensual pleasures of the table as a way to move us towards uh, more conversations around the politics of food or helping us think about what's happening locally in our um, local and regional food systems or, you know, encouraging us to think about ways in which we can use our muscle as citizens to transform public policies. So, um, you know, the things that move me, food, art, uh, culture. In fact, Anjali, the, 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 the thing that I would argue launched me into food justice activism was a song. You know, when I was in high school, I heard this brilliant song, um, a hip hop song by uh, Karis One and his group Boogie Down Productions. And it was about factory farming. I, I didn't know anything about factory farming as a 16 year old. You know, I was just kind of under the um, illusion, like many of us, uh, that, you know, animals, the cows are running around in the field and they just quietly go to sleep and wake up on our plates. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> hearing Karis One kick those lyrics, um, it just, it changed everything because, you know, he really just got to the core of the issue. Um, I feel like it, it, it kind of seems appropriate if I share that song since it was so pivotal. In my of course. Life. Okay. <laughs> Please. All right. It goes a little something like this. Beef. What a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow, the way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump. And just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies. And it gets much more graphic. And so I'll stop there because I'm assuming- Wow, all right. <laughs> so in, in the intro, I should have also called you poet, songwriter. I clearly left out a number of things here. <laughs> no, I mean, but you know, just like thinking about the impact that that song had on me, you know, my dad encouraged me to read uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair after I begged him to get me the um, tape um, is what we used to listen to music on <laughs> of um, the, the Boogie Down production tape. And so I'm just thinking about my own experiences you know, I'm very clear that, um, in fact, my, my my guiding mantra when I first started doing this work with that in mind um, has been start with the visceral to ignite the cerebral and end with the political. And, and that approach wow. was vitally important, especially working with young people, especially working with young people who came from historically marginalized neighborhoods in New York City, who were going to um, segregated, underfunded public schools. I know that the last thing we need to do um, when bringing them to our Be Healthy after school program um, was 
lecture them or talk to them. We wanted them to have an experience that helped them transform internally and, and, and got them excited about being activists because we didn't even really, you know, the, the, the program that we had was a two year program. And the first year we, we touched on the politics, but we didn't get into like community organizing training and political education and all the things that we wanted to equip these young people with so that they could um, take the lead in their communities in addressing food issues. The first year for us was really about just helping them reimagine and transform their relationship with food. You know, we wanted them to fall in love with dark leafy greens and whole grains and legumes and nuts and seeds, many of the things that they had been deprived from because of the communities in which they were living and because there were very little access to healthy, fresh and affordable food. And we saw that, you know, taking them to rural farms and community gardens and urban farms and food co-ops and teaching them about the seed to table cycle and having them go out and actually harvest food. You know, when they put their hands in the soil and they got a chance to harvest the food that they were eating, when they brought it back to the site where we were based, of course they wanted to cook it because they harvested it. And when they cooked it, they were so invested in trying it. Look, some of these young people came in our program um, and they told us, you know, I haven't eaten vegetable since I was in middle school, or I only drink sodas because water's nasty or whatever things that may sound ridiculous to us, but these were young people living on the margins and that was their reality. And what we found was that when they made, you know, these things that typically under any other circumstance, they wouldn't have tried. And, um, you know, these different varieties of fresh vegetables and, you know, whole grains and legumes, if they made it, they tried it. And the more that they try these things, the more that it opened up their palates and made them more um, excited about enjoying a, a diversity of um, real food, whole foods, good food that they just had been deprived of. And then from there, when they recognized the, the structural realities that prevented them from having access to this type of food, then they wanted to, they were excited. They were pumped up about um, being organizers in their communities, whether they're their geographic community, their school or the door where we were based. So it, it always starts with food for me. That's incredible. I mean, I, I, what's that? <laughs> I said, but it's not just about food. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's incredible. And hearing you talk with the passion that you do, it's so clear that while it starts with food, to your point, it's not just about food. And it's so clear that there is a mission and an activism behind this and a real care for young people. And, you know, I, I was I was reading up on, you know, how creating this book was more than showcasing history and homages. It was also about widening the scope and the voices of people of color, particularly Black Americans, who are featured in publications um, like this. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about, about that side of things as you were writing this book. And, you know, is, is that sort of kind of the, the next piece of, of where you're, you're looking at as you think about your own trajectory? Yeah. Well, I'm always, I've always thought about diversifying these spaces that um, many times aren't welcoming to BIPOC folks. You know, um, that was a case when I was doing more on the ground grassroots organizing and base building uh, when I first started this work. And, um, you know, even when I started publishing, you know, as an author, um, moving into the publishing world, because I had such amazing mentors, um, you know, Anna LaPay, my co-author of my first book, Grub, um, she and her mother had written a book before her mother, Frances Moore LaPay, who wrote the seminal book, Died for a Small mm -hmm. Planet in the 1970s. And we were, when our book, Grub, was published, uh, Frankie was celebrating, I think it was the 35th anniversary of the publication of Die for a Small Planet. And we got a chance to go on tour together um, in a few cities. And I learned so much from her and just like everything from professionalism to continuing to hone one's craft to just, you know, being prepared for interviews. These things that I would have learned eventually, but having a seasoned pro kind of walk me along just um, help me click into it um, more easily. And, you know, I have always felt just so honored and blessed to have had someone play that role in my life that 
I, I like to say that I'm always thinking about paying it forward. And I, I see the imprint uh, for color, my new publishing imprint at Penguin Random House, as simply a formalization of what I've been doing informally um, for almost two decades now. And now I have more um, resources and power to actually publish the work of people that I believe in and, and, and you know, ensure that more voices, more BIPOC voices, more diverse voices are being heard um, in media, but specifically food media. And the great thing is that, you know, I'm so we'll be publishing books as an imprint. And that's one part of how we see ourselves increasing diversity in food media and giving more voice to those that have been silenced and erased and marginalized. Uh, but we're also, there are like real action arm, there's an action arm to the imprint. You know, one of the first things I did was I brought on a cultural strategist. Oh, wow. Ashara, Ashara Ekundayo is um, now a Detroit based, um, well, between Oakland and Detroit based um, gallerist, uh, curator, uh, community builder. And I'm very clear that I, we need to be like this imprint has to be accountable to community. And I want to ensure that as we grow, as we continue, as our list unfolds, that we're doing um, we're, we're acquiring book projects and we're doing work that really does serve um, the, the best interests of the community. And so um, having Ashara on board has been amazing. And we're like, we, we were in the midst of planning. So just talking about some of the action components of how For Color sees ourselves um, diversifying food media. Um, we had been planning a Black Food Summit that we um, were going to um, hold at MOAD, the Museum of the African Diaspora, where I have my residency. Where you have your residency, that's right. Yeah, um, but because of just the precariousness of whatever, this public health crisis, <laughs> we decided to uh, wait until the spring. So we're really hoping to do that in the spring. We've been working to amass databases of Black art directors and food photographers and food stylists and prop stylists so that there's a resource for people. Because, you know, too often I've heard the excuse, well, we looked for a Black photographer or we looked for a Black art director or whatever, but we just couldn't find anyone. <laughs> And so I'm here to say, well, there are a lot of brilliant people working out there and we have a list. All you got to do is click the button and you have like a whole, you have multiple <laughs> lists of um, different BIPOC folks working in food media. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I don't even that, know. No, that's, in, that's incredible. Um, and actually on that point of just, you know, broadening the scope of BIPOC, you know, creatives and food. I mean, obviously, in, in writing this book outside of the database that you're you know, creating here, in writing this book, you clearly were thoughtful about who was going to be in the book and how that was presented. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight into kind of like what that process was like, how you thought about it? Um, and then potentially if there are any future, you know, BIPOC chefs we should be paying attention to. Sure. Well, I just I think it's important for me to recognize that I am the my name's on the cover, obviously. And, um, you know, I, I understand why that's the case. However, it's important for me to recognize that I, I, I'm the convener. I'm the person who like brought together a brilliant team of creatives to create this book. Um, and, and, and you know, I, I recognize and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to also kind of model how we need to like recognize what our limitations are and then understand the power of building community around a shared um, goal. And so I know what I know. I know um, what my, my blind spots are. And so one of the first things that I did when putting this book together is I, I pulled together what I call my kitchen cabinet. And these are three trusted colleagues whom I love. Quite literally, your kitchen yeah, cabinet. Yeah, they're, they're literally my kitchen cabinet. <laughs> so um, Dara Cooper, who's a national food justice activist and leader. Um, Scott Alvis Barton, who's a chef and professor at the NYU Food Studies Program. Um, Therese Nelson, who's a caterer, um, chef, storyteller, brilliant um, community builder. You know, I, I pulled them, I, I called them and let them know that we're putting this book together and I want them to help me think through the book. You know, everything from helping me think about the best places where I should put, you know, 
the different people who are bringing their brilliance to the book, to introducing me to people that I, I may have heard of or kind of know from a distance, but don't know personally, because this is a global book. You, you mentioned the contributors. This is a, a diasporic cookbook. You know, we have contributors um, throughout the African continent, the Caribbean, um, uh, you know, a large part of them come from uh, the United States, but really people from wherever people of African descent, Africans have traveled in the, the world, we've, you know, brought those people together to offer their thoughts and their reflections on um, Black food. And I, I feel like, I, I know you had mentioned earlier when we had kind of a pre setup, you had mentioned um, or just kind of wondering, you know, how do I think about, or how do I define black food? Yeah. And I, I, I feel like it's important for me to, to put that out. And I'll tell you like one of the other things that I've been pushing back against since I started working around food issues are the, the very reductive ways that people think about, talk about, write about, um, I'll say African-American cuisine. And, and this is what I found. Most often when people like when people say black food or hear black food, I think what they are thinking is African-American cuisine. But what they're what, what I found that people imagine when they are thinking about African-American cuisine are two things. One, they're kind of imagining the antebellum survival food upon which many um, enslaved Africans in the United States had to rely. Right. That's that's the kind of vision because there are these like both the real and imagined way in which many enslaved Africans had to rely upon just the remnants of the plantation owner's tables. You know, the worst parts of the vegetables, the animal viscera, you know, all those things. But the reality is one, there were free blacks in the United States before 1865. And um, the institution of slavery wasn't a monolith. You know, it didn't look the same um, in the coastal Carolinas as it might look in what people describe as a black belt, you know, place like Tennessee and Arkansas and Mississippi. And that would look different than it did in Louisiana. And that looked different than it did in the Caribbean. So this idea that we can reduce black food or, um, African-American cuisine to just slave food, which is what I hear people, um, you know, calling it. That's, that's the, the kind of negative way in which, our, our cuisine has been vilified. That's slave food, you know? I don't wanna eat that. Like that's the food that's killing us. And so that is certainly one part, a subset of a larger, more diverse and complex cuisine. And I'm not denying that, but that's not the whole. The other thing that I found, the other way that I found people talking about um, black food or when they imagine African-American cuisine is, you know, people think soul food. And what do they think when they hear soul food? They think about the big flavored meats, the overcooked vegetables, the sugary desserts that one might find at a soul food restaurant. And I'm not denying that that's a part, that's a part, an important part of black food culture as well. But for me, you know, why would I understand why the wider culture would vilify our cuisine? I mean, it's just a part of part and parcel of like a larger trend of anti-black racism that we see on all areas in you know on right. all levels, right? <laughs> so I that's I get that, and I'm not terribly concerned about um, educating the wider the wider public about, um, you know, the diversity and complexity of our food, unless people want to know. And that's why I write books because I want to inv invite those into the conversation who are genuinely curious. I'm not invest invested in changing the people's mind. Who's made, who've made, made their made minds up already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so but, when people talk about black food who are interested, what is the definition that you you want them to have? Is it a perspective that it that it is this diversity and it's not just these two ends? Or how would you how would you want them to picture it? I want people to understand that this is a quiz, cuisine. Um, just talking about the the, the 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 food traditions here, the traditional um, foods of African Americans in in what we know as the United States. I mean, if we look at the the staples, if we look at the classic ingredients, the the the, the you know the the classic dishes, the staple. I mean, just like the core traditional foods, it's they're largely vegetable based. You know, I think about the way in which my working class grandparents would eat 
And one, they'd be eating in a way that um, a lot of, you know, people who have a lot of resources in like Northern California and other parts, that's the way that they would argue we should be eating. And that's the way that they ate naturally. And it wasn't anything special because it was just a part of the way that they survived and a part of the way that they thrived, growing their own food, being in charge of producing what um, they fed their families with. And so, you know, even if we look in Western Central Africa, um, parts of what we know as a Caribbean, like so many of these traditional diets are largely vegetable based. Before the industrialization of our food system, most working class and working poor um, Black folks couldn't afford to have meat at every single meal. You know, these are things like having meat and, and just like these sumptuous, overabundant spreads. Those are things in most, like in many cultures that are reserved for holidays and special occasions. And the same thing in many traditional cultures in West and Central Africa. We've seen these trends. And so I just feel like, you know, is my grandfather's diet or his garden of, you know, an abundance of dark leafy greens like collards, mustards, turnips, kale, dandelions, you know, the sugar snap peas, the black eyed peas, the pole beans, the sweet potatoes, the muscadine grapes, the walnuts, the pecans. Are those not authentically black food? Is my grandfather not an authentically black man? <laughs> and so I just want us to expand how we think about the food that's here, but even you know globally, because you can't talk about the food and and you know black food in the, the United States without talking about the global influences. In fact, I would argue that you know African American cuisine is the original modern global cuisine. When you think about the the, the staples and um, food traditions and cooking techniques that traveled from Western Central Africa and then that were melded with you know these Western European cooking traditions and staples and ingredients, along with the, the staples and ingredients and traditions that are indigenous to this land. And so um, I, I, my goal is to expand people's understanding of what Black food is and, and what Black food is, is um, African diaspora food. Incredible. Um, another thing that I read is you cited Toni Morrison's The Black Book um, as inspiration. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. There we go. It's a repo. This is not the original. I wish I had an original from the 70s. <laughs> it's a reissue. Mm -hmm. Well, to that end, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that inspiration and what it means to you as part of this book and the story you're trying to tell. Sure. Uh, the Black Book was a book that uh, Toni Morrison edited uh, in the 1970s, and it's really an encyclopedic look at the Black American experience. And I love just the 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 kind of multi-layered approach that she used to telling stories from archival photos to um you know the lyrics of songs to you know ephemera whatever um i mean to you know in text just like she brought together these different ways of storytelling to tell a story of african americans from 1619 to what like the late 1940s and so you know, the way in which that book honors the past and reminding us where we've been, but looking forward, I, I feel like it embodies Sankofa, as we discussed earlier. And so, you know, with this book, I mean, literally, like, that book, the Black book, has been a major inspiration. Um, but I, I actually wanted to read a quote to you, because more than that book, just Toni Morrison as a creative of person, course. as a brilliant writer and editor, um, inspired just absolutely so many, so many aspects of this um, project. So for the, you know, I, I spent Anjali maybe three months having eight to 10 Zooms calls with people throughout the globe who are potential contributors. And I felt like it was important for me to move beyond just an email and actually have a call with people and, and really explain the importance of this project and, and enroll them and, and, you know, and convince them to be a part of such a historical book. But this is the quote that I um, shared with people in the email that I sent out um, mm. to set up call. And it reads, when I think about Black food, I keep coming back to Toni Morrison's quote, quote, <laughs> the function of racism is distraction. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being, end quote. 
While this book will acknowledge the historical and contemporary ways in which our people have been marginalized, exploited, and erased, the main focus of this project is our agency, creation, and empowerment. What emerges when we aren't distracted by racism? How are we empowered? What are the ways our humanity is displayed? What are we curious about? What brings us joy? And so when I when I further expounded, I, I, I let people know that, you know, this is a book that I see as FUBU. You know, FUBU is a, a popular clothing um, brand started by Damon Johns in the 1990s, but it stands for For Us, By Us. And that's what this book was about. I, I told people that this book is us having a conversation. And I, I don't want people to be concerned with the white gaze when creating their pieces, whatever they're contributing. We don't need to explain anything. We don't have to walk people through. We just need to tell our truth. And I invite the world to, to look in. But, you know, I was very clear and continue to be clear that, you know, we need more um, work that is unfiltered and honest and speaking our truth. And, you know, I think when you're coming from that place, even if people don't agree with it or like it, they have to respect it. Absolutely. And what would you tell, you know, young folks of color who are looking up to you now and saying like, oh, my God, like, the fact that this exists, that maybe I can do this too, but maybe they're hesitant to tell their truth. Sure. How do you how do you talk to them about that? That's a great question. The first thing I would say is um, the most important thing to tend to is your inner life. And what we manifest, what we create in this world starts from within our thoughts um, the emotion and energy we have behind the thoughts, the repetition of those thoughts, writing down our goals, envisioning them. And so, um, and I'm saying this coming off of, you know, a decade of largely abandoning many of the practices that have helped me. I, I won't say largely abandoning, but I haven't been as attentive to many of the practices that that I would argue helped me even get to this point. That helped me because so many, so much of what's happening in my life now. And I'm I'm an Aquarius. I'm in we're in Northern Cal. So I'm, I'm an Aquarius in, too. See, I know you can get this because we're <laughs> how we do. But I so much of what's unfolded in my life I wrote down 20 years ago. I was doing like you know this quote. Uh, I think it was Alice Waters about well what what are we willing to, what, what's the rent we're willing to pay for um, the privilege of living on this earth? And I, I would write down my goals. I want to transform the food system. I'm going to have this, you know, community-based organization. I, I eventually will write books and all these things. And, and I just think it's, so and you when- you were writing this 20 plus years ago. Yeah, I was writing this 20 plus, I mean, I, I could literally pull out like vision boards and, you know, wow. lists, checklists. So I'm saying that to say that after- my wife and I had children, our first child, it just, I don't know if anybody can be prepared for it, but I wasn't. And um, it just, the rigors of parenting and and and, and juggling parenting and, and work and family and all the things that I had to hold, you know, so many of the, the things that I, I have to have, my meditation practice, my, my yoga, um, you know, physical, physical activity and being committed to that. It was, it was harder for me to maintain those things. And over the pandemic in 2020, one of the blessings was that I, I, I refound myself and I, I got back to my core and, and, and remembered and, and started to incorporate these practices. And, and I can't live without them because I'm not successful if my inner life isn't in order and I'm not really in tune with my higher self, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, absolutely. God, Jehovah, infinite intelligence, the primal sound, like that, that force that permeates us all. So, you know, I, I could give some nuts and bolts, practical step, like you, you should, you know, get an agent first or whatever. But <laughs> I think it starts with that work because it starts with self-confidence that we can manifest and bring into existence what we need if we can be still and listen and um, do the work. Hmm. So in some ways, did the did writing a book in the pandemic, given sort of this like inner centering you had, was it was it almost like a positive thing from from that perspective? Mixed bag. I, I recognize that 
the book was written from a place of urgency and we didn't really get into this, but, you know, one of the major catalysts for me writing this book was the um, movement moment that we were in, you know, post Breonna Taylor and George Floyd's murder by the state and the subsequent uprisings, you know, we were in a movement moment and I was very clear that this is the moment that I need to act. You know, I, I, when I was younger, I, I would kind of foolishly just frame activism as confrontational um, in the streets, you know, grassroots um, base building. And all those things are like vitally important to grassroots activism. In fact, I would say they're the cornerstones of it. But I had to get past this notion that that's the only activism and understand that there are so many ways that, you know, we can and should be contributing to social movements, whether it's food justice or otherwise, because there's such systemic problems that I, I'd like to think every little drop in the bucket can move us towards, you know, some type of tipping point. And so I asked myself, well, what is it in this moment where I'm like nearing 50 and I have two children and I'm married and I'm a author and a publisher? What, what, what can I give back now to be a part of this movement moment? So one was pitching four color book or pitching black food so that we can bring together all these voices to create this book. But the other was um, pitching the imprint. And so my agent and I had long had this vision about me having a publishing imprint, but we felt like this is the moment, if not now, when, you know, we are not only looking at just like the general kind of like racial strife, the reckoning that was taking place, but, you know, specifically to our field, there was a lot of revelations about racism within food media. And, you know, I had personal friends who had dealt with and had been hurt by some institutions that um, didn't protect them and didn't support them. And so I knew that um, this was a moment where I could do what I had long desired, which was bring, you know, running an imprint, um, being able to curate my own list of books and supporting people that, um, or people who we think are going to do some important and groundbreaking work. And uh, we're doing it. We've already acquired three books and we're on the cusp of acquiring a few more. So it's just very exciting to be in, 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 in this new phase, especially because this is my last book. So that's it. And yeah, I had heard that through the SF Chronicle. So that's true. This is going to be your last book. Yeah, I'm going to hang up the cleats. I'm going to retire the jersey. <laughs> I, retire, he yeah. said. <laughs> no, I, I just, you know, there are a couple of things I always felt like I wanted to go out on top. <laughs> and so coming off of 2019, when my last book, Vegetable Kingdom, was published and you know, it just getting just all these accolades and being on the year's best list and being, you know, just uh, selling phenomenally well. And then following that with Black Food, which has just been getting so much love. It just came out yesterday. I don't know if you knew that, but, wow. you know, the immense love that we've been getting online from a lot of the magazines and, and different um, food websites. It's just been phenomenal. And so I'm like, you know, this this is good. I can I can walk away. <laughs> on this note, but I think more important, I really, I'm excited about just putting all my energy into learning how to be a good publisher. You know, yeah. this, this is a new space for me and I like being in this space. You know, I, around the time that we started the um, imprint, I was also starting CrossFit as my new, like main physical activity. It's incredible. <laughs> and it was just, I mean, I'm still just like clumsy and trying to figure out all the movements. And I love being in that space because it, it just means that I'm growing. And I feel like the where we where I want us to be in 10 years with the imprint and the impact that we're having in the world, I need to focus all my energy into building it so that we can accomplish all the goals that we've set for ourselves. That's absolutely incredible. And no doubt you'll crush it. Um, <laughs> um, so I know we're, we got a couple minutes left before we move into audience questions, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the art in the book. Cause we talked a lot about the history. We talked a lot, you know, about kind of, uh, the folks that perhaps were represented in the book, but talk a little bit about, yes, the cover of that book, who designed it, how you conceptualized it. Just talk about the art. 
let me let me big up the whole team. So first of all, this book when this is a pandemic book, it wouldn't have like there's no way we could have done this book without um, our project manager. Jenny Wapner is one of the most respected editors in food media, and she just so happened to not be working at the time. She's in between jobs. And the fact that we got her as a project manager with her expertise in publishing, um, her general brilliance, and just she's just so good. So anyway, big up to Jenny. Um, I made it very clear that this book required not just a black art director, but a black art director who knows black history, who l- understands black aesthetics and black visual language, who could connect with this book spiritually. And we, um, you know, George McCalman, this San Francisco based art director, um, I knew he was the perfect person for this. In fact, we had a conversation in a, the a cafe in SF MoMA like three years ago, mm-hmm. and it was just kind of a nebulous like, hey, we need to do something together. We're going to do something together. I don't know what it is, but it's going to be big. <laughs> and so um, I knew this was this was the thing. And, and he did a beautiful job, um, obviously, on the interior of the book. But this cover, I, I can't even like... We can have a whole conversation about just the the kind of um, how I think American cookbooks needs to break out and just do some more exciting and cool stuff. But, you know, I, I didn't want the typical cover with, you know, I don't know, whatever. Like, food somebody, on there and things like that. Yeah, like a photo. Like, somebody like, like the very uncomfortably standing behind a cutting board, like contrived smile and <laughs> the camera. <laughs> but I told George, I was like, look, I want a book that um, conveys black people and food without having black people neither black people nor food on the or food <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that he drew on was my affinity and, and love uh for classic jazz um so you know I, I sent him a lot of covers that i really like and mm-hmm. also hip-hop you know and when we think about you know hip-hop as a culture um with graffiti writing there was a period where there was um it was called wild style this use of mm-hmm. letters and and colors and kind of cryptic uh, composition and so this covers speaking to all those things um we have lillian kang our food stylist i'll go quickly who's one of the best in the business hey. oriana corin um, our photographer, along with Jillian Knox, who's the prop stylist, I had seen their work that they did for um, an issue. It was like 2019, February 2019 issue of Food and Wine. And it was an issue all about African diasporic food. And they they did the images for it. And I was I was like that. they The storytelling that they accomplish in that story is what we need to have for this book. Um, El Simone, our recipe tester who's like another person i'm like i can't believe that we managed to get you she's like the recipe tester and editor and on-screen talent at america's test kitchen she makes sure that all the recipes work and that they're delicious and um kelly snowden my editor so i I, i'm naming everyone because if i talk about this in you know as just my book i'm being dishonest this was a collective effort. I'm great at running teams. I'm great at building teams. And I, I pulled this brilliant team together and, and moved us towards our goal. And, um, you know, what, what, what a beautiful book that came out of that. And, and, and I just, it's so oh, authentic. No, 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 please, please go ahead. I was just gonna say the description is of why you are bringing up all these people is so authentic to how the book is modeled, which is also this collective history of all these people who have been a part of this journey. So it makes total sense. And I'm glad you said model, because what I wanted to say is that one of the most powerful things that I think we can do as a publisher with Four Color Books is model to the rest of the publishing industry how um, one can do things differently. And that was even, uh, uh, you know, the process of putting this book together. You know, we documented it. We are excited about sharing that process because we did it with such love and care and thoughtfulness. I mean, the the fact that for months, and I've never done this with any of my books, but for months leading up to the photo shoots, we would meet every week, the whole team, art director, photographer, food stylist, prop stylist. um, And we would 
just massage every aspect of the book, what the color ways for each chapter would be, because we wanted those to be distinct, what the, wow. the, the propping and the lighting and the composition of each photo is, the storytelling that we were hoping to accomplish with each image. And, um, you know, the process of putting this book together was equally important as the, the outcome, um, the product. And I'm really glad that we did that because I, I hope that we can inspire um, others who are working on projects, but specifically in publishing and putting books together to just think about the different way that we can do things and breaking out of just the habits or the patterns that I think, you know, we often just do it because that's always, it's, it's the way that it's always been done, but sometimes it may not be working as well anymore. Well, undoubtedly, you will accomplish that goal. And um, thank you for sharing a bit of the process, because as you said, the process was as important as the output. And I feel like today we got such a good insight into all the nitty gritty of the process here, which um, which will make reading this book for so many of our audience members that much richer. Mm -hmm. So with that, I think we will try to move to some audience questions here. Um, let's see. First question I have here. Do you think COVID has changed our relationship with food? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll say that I, I have to credit COVID partially with my book, Vegetable Kingdom, doing so well. And part of it is because more people were cooking at home. And I think it was exciting to see that, um, you know, whatever people, a lot of people were forced to, but I think from that, I was noticing a level of, you know, interest and excitement that moved beyond the necessity of it. And we saw that, I mean, cookbooks did extremely well in 2020. And so I hope that more people are, um, you know, cooking at home. Um, I, I think what COVID did with the shelter in place, with this whole pandemic has done um it's exposed many of the inequities that currently exist in our society um and amplified them you know it exacerbated them for a lot of people and so in that way you know covid because here's the thing when we talk about food insecurity or or food injustice um and and to be clear the the term food desert is is largely um, being rejected by, you know, a lot of food justice activists, particularly those more, the ones that have more of a structural, I hope all food justice activists have a structural analysis, but <laughs> the, the more left-leaning um, food activists have largely rejected that term food desert. And, 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 and we are now talking about food apartheid to put the, um, the, the, the structural barriers the economic, um, physical, geographic barriers that prevent people from accessing healthy, fresh, and affordable and culturally appropriate food. So, you know, uh, uh, what I was getting at, though, is that when we think about lack of access to healthy, fresh, affordable, culturally appropriate food in communities, um, typically it's simply one indicator of material deprivation. You know, most communities where you can't find an organic apple or my um, colleague who was working, doing some food security work in Brooklyn, he talked about the community in which he's working. And he said, you can get like a stolen gun faster than you can get an organic apple. So when you talk about those communities, typically um, those communities have very little access to healthy, fresh, affordable food. They have crumbling infrastructure, uh, segregated, underfunded public schools. They're usually dealing with, um, you know, oftentimes uh, environmental racism, you know, talk about being physically active. So many of these places have very little green space for people to be active in and, you know, get their heart pumping. And so we can't just look at food um, issues, um, you know, in a silo. We need to think about the way that they intersect with many of these other issues in terms of like the way that people's lives um, are materially impacted when they're living in historically marginalized communities. And so in that way, you know, there are a lot of ways that we've been thinking about food because people have been struggling and, and, and dealing with a range of issues. And so people have been stepping up and we've been, you know, I've been seeing amazing projects around like 
you know, mutual aid, uh, community kitchens providing free meals for people, community refrigerators where people who are more fortunate can go donate um, fresh produce and other food items for people to grab. Um, and I'm excited about those things. But the reality is, is that we have to continue to uh, focus on, you know, transforming the the policies that prevent communities from thriving, whether it's, you know, the, the innumerable policies. So I'm just going to leave it at that. No, I mean, well, this ties into some of the questions we got about, you know, how some of the audience members want to know how we can become food activists in our own everyday lives. And you're kind of alluding to the different ways in which you might be able to do that. Yeah. And it goes back to what I said earlier, just um, I think it's important for every one of us to figure out what's the most effective way that we can give back. And I think all of us, you know, I think about food. I mean, yeah. So you have like the people who are in communities most impacted by food injustice and they're doing the survival work. They're doing the work that has been happening in many of these communities, despite them being, you know, labeled as food deserts. Um, there has been a lot of abundance and creativity and, um, you know, homegrown. Um, because if we talk about, you know, I, I think when we use that term food justice, it's important to recognize, I believe, that food justice calls for organized responses by those most impacted by food insecurity, right? And so the solutions, I, I would argue, have to be owned and driven by those living in communities being impacted by those issues. Not that mm -hmm. philanthropic institutions can't support, not that more privileged people who may have access to resources and, you know, whatever might push the movement along, but in terms of like where the movement is going and, and how it's unfolding and how the, the, you know, on the ground issues are being addressed, it has to come from the people because the people know that there are issues and, and, and oftentimes they have creative solutions, but people need resources. They need power shifted to their hands so that they can be self-determined. And it's exciting seeing a lot of um, people who just are very clear that, you know, the U.S. government isn't going to save us. Late stage capitalism isn't going to save us. And so we have to create parallel institutions that will, you know, be those those foundation, those support, no matter what's going on, whether we're in a crisis or not. And it, it's been powerful seeing communities come together and do that. But I'm saying that to, all that to say is that while we're looking at food, we have to keep one eye on the the, the many structural issues. and 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 that's where we can, you know, contribute as, okay. And I'm going to say this, <clears throat> I know I'm, I'm dropping a lot. There's so many things I just want to like share with you all, but I just want to say that I'm excited that so many more people are invested in being a part of the food movement, you know, just this push to buy more local and seasonal and sustainable um, food or shop with, you know, independent artisans or small farmers, or, you know, just, um, buying fair trade um, products or organic or local seasonal, whatever. But here's the thing. I think that so often we've been like, what I've seen stalling the movement in many ways is this, this idea that people have that consumer action is the most effective way to, to change our food system. And that somehow we can buy our way out of these problems. And I simply think that that's not the case. Consumer, I mean, look, yeah, like if you have resources like me and other people who have a lot of disposable income, you could do whatever. You could go to a whole, I'm not going to name any companies. You can go to expensive <laughs> corporate owned health food stores and spend your money. You can go to the farmer's market. You can do whatever. But what about the people who are living in communities like West Oakland when I first moved Absolutely. here from Brooklyn in 2008? Um, and that community, you know, there's a study that showed that there were like 43 corner stores and liquor stores upon which the residents of that community had to rely for their food. And there wasn't one single supermarket. And not that supermarkets are the cornerstone of food security, but every community deserves a full service supermarket. And so, um, yeah. I Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to try and squeeze one last audience question and then I will move to my last question for you. And hopefully this is a rapid, quick, 
quick answer here, but one, yeah, one of our uh, audience members wants to know, she says, I always love to hear what acclaimed chefs feed their toughest critics, their kids. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you making for your kids these days? Well, let me say this, uh, Vegetable Kingdom, which was the book prior to Black Food, um, the litmus test for the success of, I would say, 80% of the recipes in there was would my daughters like them? Because they're just brutally honest. They're just like candid to a fault. And so, you know, if they don't like it, they will let me know immediately. Like they'll spit it out. Like, this this is not good, dad. And so when I'm testing recipes, I I really rely on their um, brutal honesty because I want to make sure I'm putting out good food. And what I saw um, throughout the process, because part of the process of writing that book was just like helping them to fall in love with more of the diversity of the vegetable kingdom. And that drove a lot of the recipes. So I was trying to figure out creative ways to make them like vegetables that they probably wouldn't like if they're just prepared in some, you know, whatever traditional way or just the the expected way. So I'll give you an example and then I'll wrap up. One of my favorite recipes in the book is the, um, the, uh, caramelized fennel. And I'm I'm sure a lot of people just, people have an interesting relationship with fennel, but I caramelized it in, um, olive oil for about 20 minutes, kind of turning it so that all the sides are nice and, and golden and caramelized. And then um, bringing in these African diasporic elements, I basted the fennel in uh, a mojo, which is this um, sauce and marinade that's popular in Cuba that it's like lime juice, orange juice, a little vinegar, some um, garlic, a little bit of um, sweetener. So I basted it in that for 10 minutes. And then I served it with this um, sunchoke cream and plantain powder, which is just simply uh, mm-hmm. green plantains that have been ground into a powder. And that, I have to say, you don't even need to like make the plantains. So go buy some prepackaged green plantains, grind it in a spice grinder and throw that stuff on everything. And, you know, they loved that. They loved it so much. And so I'm I'm clear that if we can put the effort into like creatively making interesting um, food from the vegetable kingdom, the kids will meet us halfway. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's incredible. Um, well, I think with that, we will kind of wrap up audience questions and um, we will move to my final question, um, which is a Commonwealth tradition here. But what is your 60 second idea to change the world? It don't even need to be 60 seconds. It's five seconds. Let let women run everything. Oh, that might be the best answer we've heard here so far. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) I think we'd all be the better for it. So, (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, Brian Terry, for joining me today at Inform at the Commonwealth Club. It was such a pleasure having you. Um, As a reminder to everyone who's listening, um, Brian's book, Black Food, can be purchased through your preferred bookseller. You heard it today. It just came out yesterday. So go get your copy. Um, If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club, please visit thecommonwealthclub.org. And any final comments from you for folks who are picking up this book before we kind of close out? Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, I know I'm extremely Zoom fatigued. I I think many of us are. So I appreciate you um, joining us this evening. Uh, Please check me out on social media. I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, My handle is Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T. And then Terry, T-E-R-Y. Check me out there. My website, triple dub, uh, bryant-terry.com. And I I just want to say, it's a weird thing. I feel like we're living in these parallel universes. A lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are doing fine. A lot of people have been like working from home and spending more time with family. And, you know, their lives have largely gone uninterrupted in many ways. But a lot of people's, you know, are are struggling. And I just want to encourage us all to think about what we might be able to do to contribute to a, a more positive world in this moment. Like I said, whether it's like volunteering, whether it's, you know, donating, whether it's, you know, using your social capital and connections um, to 
you know, transform systems locally, but definitely as citizens thinking about how we can continue to use our voice on the local, on the state and the federal level to change policies so that the system works for all of us and not just a wealthy few. What an incredible way to end the show. Thank you so much again, Brian Terry. Thank you all who are watching and I hope you all stay safe. Take care, everyone.